Appreciate everybody coming out uh, to uh, cover Penn State football. Really appreciate it. Uh, kind of getting into the uh, the bowl game, and obviously uh, our opponent, Memphis. You know, from what I understand, it's our first time in the history of, of Penn State football playing the University of Memphis, which is pretty cool. Um, Want to congratulate Coach Silverfield on his uh, on his uh, appointment as the as the head coach. Um, at Memphis, obviously a great opportunity for him and a program that's done some wonderful things over the last you know, five, six years. Um, he's got a lot of uh, background, obviously, both in college as an offensive line coach as well as the NFL. You know, so tremendous opportunity. It's great when you see people that get promoted from within. Uh, you look at Memphis and what they've done this year with a, with a win over ranked uh, ranked Navy team, with a ranked Cincinnati team two times which is very difficult to do, uh, to beat someone in the regular season and then beat them again in a conference championship. And it's magnified when you do it in back-to-back -back weeks. Um, obviously, the, the biggest bowl game in the university's history. I think a lot of these bowl games, um, one of the big, one of the big um, factors in these games is mentality. And obviously, for them, uh, playing in the biggest bowl game in the history of the university, uh, sets, sets of mentality. I think the other thing that's interesting is obviously one of the one of the aspects of college football at this time of year is is some of the coaching changes and coaching turnovers just become the reality of college football. One of the things that's interesting though is I I don't really think and I, and I don't mean this uh, the wrong way. I don't want this to come off as a slight to Coach Norvell because I got tremendous respect for him. But this program is used to turnover. Um, Coach Lorig. Uh, our special teams coordinator came from there. If you look, they averaged seven staff turnover, staff changes a year. Uh, I think over the last four years, they've had as many as seven, they've had at least seven and as many as nine changes on staff every single year uh, at Memphis. So what I mean is their players are used to this. You know, they're used to, to coaching changes at this time of the year in the program. Uh, and they've been able to, to be very successful, obviously, with it. Uh, offense coordinator for the game, Kevin Johns. Kevin is a longtime offensive coordinator. He's been, been doing it um, all over the country. Um, obviously, stepping into this role for this game, uh, you look at you look. He's been a he's been a coordinator in the Big Ten. He's very familiar with us. Uh, we're very familiar with him, but obviously, we don't expect a whole lot to change. Just like with us. And what we see on film is what we expect. You know, there may be a little game plan specific wrinkle for us and for them, but not a whole lot different. Uh, they're 11 personnel team. They will mix in some 12 personnel and 10 personnel as well, but they're predominantly 11 personnel team. Guys we've been impressed with is the quarterback, Brady White. Uh, the running back, Kenneth Gainwell, has had a fantastic year. Redshirt freshman. Uh, and then two wide receivers, Antonio Gibson and Demonte Coxie. Both, both have had great years. Uh, quarterbacks put up big numbers as well as the running back. And then on defense, Adam Fuller, a guy again who's been a, a defensive coordinator for, for most of his career, has been a head coach as well, has been on the staff and is, is sliding into this role. 21 years of coaching experience. Uh, obviously having again Coach Lurie here gives us a little bit of familiarity with their personnel and some of their staff as well. They're a, a base 4-3 uh, defense. They play, you know, cover four, they play cover three, and then they play their fire zones like everybody else does. They are a high pressure team. We expect to see a lot of pressures in this game. Uh, we're impressed with their defensive end, number 55, Bryce Huff. Their linebacker, number 25, Austin Hall. And then their corner, number 17, Chris Claybooks. Guys have played a lot of football for them. And then special teams, a guy that I know very well, Pete Lembo. Pete's been the head, was the head coach at Lehigh here at the state, head coach at Elon head coach at Ball State, and then most recently at Maryland and at Rice, and is now uh, at Memphis as their special teams coordinator. Again, number seven, Chris Claybook shows up on special teams a lot for them. Uh, number 14, uh, Antonio Gibson, again, shows up, making a bunch of big, big plays for them. And then their place kicker, uh, number 36, Riley Patterson, has had a, had a really good year. So uh, we're impressed with them on tape. We had a really good practice. Um, yesterday, um, we'll have practice again today, and then obviously you know, we, we get ready to head to the bowl game and, and been jumping through all the um, you know, all the different organizational things that we gotta 
make sure everybody's on the same page from the staff and from a player perspective. But um, you know, looking forward to getting down there. We've heard nothing but great things about the Cotton Bowl and how it's run. Um, you know, the pride and the tradition that they have, as well as obviously, you know, getting to um, you know also experience some of the Dallas Cowboys and the and the you know the uh, the impact that they have on the game as well. So looking forward to experiencing it all and, and open up the questions. Raise your hand, I'll get a mic to you. How you doing, James? Good. I can't believe you've transitioned to pants. It's <laughs> long short. There's long sleeves too. It's kind of cold out there. Hey, how have you handled the OC uh, responsibility since Ricky decided to go? Who will be calling the plays in the bowl? And to the extent that you can, can you tell us where the search is at this point? Yeah. So, um, so without giving you too many details, but giving you enough that you guys can do your jobs. Um, for the game, um, Tyler Tyler is stepping into the, that responsibility, very similar to how Ricky Ronnie did um, in the past. Uh, Tyler's done a great job. He's been with me for a long time since he was a player, um, and uh, excited about this opportunity for him. Uh, we've promoted Kirk Campbell for the game uh, on an interim basis to, to be the quarterbacks coach, and he'll do a great job. Of course, both those guys have very bright futures. And then obviously the rest of the staff, everybody kind of jumping in. Uh, Jay Wan Sider does a, does a fantastic job for us. Uh, Jared Parker does a fantastic job. And Matt Lyon, so everybody's kind of jumping in and helping. Um, we've also promoted Carpenter. Uh, Carpenter's been promoted to the offensive graduate assistant. That's where I do think these analysts, I don't even know if you guys know Jeff Carpenter, uh, but Jeff Carpenter uh, have been an off the field analyst for us. That's where I think these analyst positions are important because they, they help at this time of year. Guys are able to transition and kind of be waiting in the wings type of deal. Uh, but Jeff Carpenter has uh, been with us as a student assistant um, and then left and, and, and is back with us. Uh, so he's going to slide into that graduate assistant position that Mark Dupuy was in. So um, that's how that's going. And then the, the search, um, obviously been talking to a lot of different people. Um, and then been doing a lot of different uh, studies from a data perspective. Guys that uh, have called the game and what their numbers have been like and have watched a bunch of tape. Uh, because the reality is, um, you know, this hire obviously is an important hire. But on top of that, um, you know, we need someone that's going to be able to come in and blend. We don't really, you know, want someone to come in and start all over again. You, know, you look at that across the country, you look at that even in our conference where maybe it took the first four or five games to people get used to a new system. And uh, we're looking for somebody that uh, has the experience as well as the humility to come in and blend, to say, okay, what are the things that I have conviction about for me to run my offense um, that you know, I, I, I can't really change. I need these things to be comfortable in, in calling the offense. And what things can we keep the same from a verbiage standpoint um, so that the players ha aren't having to learn a completely new system? So what, what, what things can change so, and what things could stay the same? So that's, that's what we're looking for, someone that can come in and do that. Um, you know, so between conversations and, and flights and trying to balance the game and finish up recruiting and then also the, the hiring process. Um, it's a lot this time of year. So, you know, there's nothing like getting back at, at 4 a.m. in the morning and having a 7 a.m. staff meeting uh, after, after talking to someone. So um, that, that's just kind of how it is this time of year. And, um, you know, hopefully we can, we can make some decisions sooner uh, rather than later. James, well, I like the beard. Thank you. Well, okay. Uh -huh. First, will Tyler receive consideration for the coordinator's position? And secondly, um, what kind of what do you expect from Sean Clifford as far as his health goes? Is he uh, fully participating in practice now? Yeah, we we expect Sean to be a hundred percent. He's not full. Uh, right now, he's taking most of the reps, but, but, he, but he's not 100% right now, but I, we ex anticipate him being 100%. He's better right now than he was at the end of the year, if that makes sense. Um, 
And, and, and Tyler and, and the rest of our staff have, have all uh, received consideration for the job and, and continue to, um, I kind of look at it in some ways like, you know, maybe, um, you know, when, when John Donovan uh, left and, and Ricky Ronnie filled in, in that role uh, when, we hired, when we hired Joe Moran. So it's, it's, it's probably more similar to that right now at this stage. How you doing, James? Good, how are you? Good. Um, I remember last year, if I remember correctly, you said that you guys would have a 60-40 or 70-30 balance between, you know, the task at hand and, you know, enjoying Orlando uh, for the Citrus Bowl. Do you expect something similar, you know, for this year in Dallas? Or? Yeah, you know, uh, I don't know. I'd have to go back and check the records of what the percentage I said, but, you know, uh, it's probably not that, you know, uh, to be honest, it's, it's kind of like when we went to Ireland and everybody's like, oh, what a wonderful cultural experience this is going to be for the, the team and the coaches. And we pretty much were, you know, in the hotel or on the practice field the whole time. I think, I think the guys rode around on like one double-decker bus. That was about all we got. Um, you know, I think the bowl games are, are, are similar. I think they're great for the fans. I think they're great for the families, our wives and kids. Um, and, and, and you know a lot a lot of the staff to administration um, but but for the coaches <clears throat> you know we try to get as much work as we did as we can done ahead of time so it's not a total grind but it, it's a grind you know um, you know we have meetings and, and we have practice and, and then there's a lot of mandatory events you know that the bowl does um, but but you know I, I think the, the players will They'll get the experience down with Dallas. Hopefully, not so much that it, that it takes away and becomes a distraction for the game. Because you know, most importantly, we got to find a way to win this game against a really good, talented opponent that thrives in these types of games. In my mind, uh, one of the things we've gone back is shown. If you look over the last four or five years, uh, all of the Power <laughs> Five teams, uh, like Ole Miss from this year, and people like that, that this team, you know, has beat. I think UCLA falls into that category, things like that. So, just uh, you know, again, we want to go enjoy the whole experience, which I think we will. I think we've gotten better at that. I've had good conversations with our players as well about that. There's an understanding of expectation, standard of how we do things. But um, but at the end of the day, the most important thing is after that game, you know, we're uh, you know we're putting bowl champions on our rings bringing that trophy back to the facility um, and sending these seniors out the right way and also uh, providing some momentum going into the offseason. Yep. Hey, James. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning. Um, Memphis is known for having a pretty explosive passing attack. I wondered what you saw in their passing game. And also, could you describe how you feel your secondary played in the last month of the season starting Minnesota through Memphis? Yep. So I think if, if you look at them, um, and most teams like this, um, they typically, you know, uh, match up uh, well when it comes to skill positions. Uh, that's that's been the case as long as I can remember. And they got some guys uh, at the skill positions that would play anywhere in the country. Um, so it's going to be a challenge. Quarterbacks put up good numbers. Uh, this system has has produced a bunch of good numbers for a long time. And then, um, you know, when it comes to, to our secondary, I, I, again, I don't ever look at it that way. It's it's all of it. It's pass rush. It's pressure in the quarterback. It's it's, it's secondary. Um, it's it's all those things. So we you know we had some we had some uh, blown assignments uh, late in the year that that uh, you know I don't think we necessarily should have had. And I think our players and staff feel the same way. Um, but but I know you know we're looking forward to this opportunity. You know, clean some things up, play well in this bowl game, get pressure on the quarterback, sack the quarterback, make some plays on the balls, uh, on the balls as well. Um, but yeah, I think I think we got a very high standard here of how we want to play and, and what we want to do. I also would make the argument to you. you know, sometimes the, the statistics can be skewed, and, and I know you're also basing this off of just kind of watching the game. But also, you know, when you're so good at defending the run like we've been, that people are going to throw the ball a lot more, which is going to make it, you know, make you susceptible to giving up a few more of those plays. Uh, but it's a, it's a little bit of all those things. It's a little bit of all those things. Yeah. Good 
Good morning, James. Good morning. When it comes to uh, the freshmen, this is the time of year where you find out who really broke through that wall and who was able to finish their season. Uh, anyone particularly standing out through this bowl preparation that really shows you an indication that they're in a good spot? Yeah, there, there's some guys, you know, there's some guys that, um, you know, probably similar to a Rasheed Walker, where at this point, at the end of the year, is really doing some good things, and, and you could make the argument you could have played them. So a lot of those guys kind of start out real strong, and then they kind of go into the kind of freshman funk, and then they kind of fight through it, uh, and they're they're really doing some nice things at this point. You know, I think you know, Cade Wallace is a guy that is really playing well right now with a lot of confidence and doing a lot of different good things for us. Uh, Joey Porter's a guy that, that kind of jumps out my man, mind. Lance Dixon is a guy. Tyler Rudolph are guys that, that probably jump out uh, in my mind right now. Um, you know, Brenton Strange is probably a guy early on um, you know, that did some did some really good things. So there's a bunch. I hate to do this because I'm going to miss somebody and someone's parent is going to be mad at me or, or some kid's going to be mad at me. But um, those are the guys that probably jump out to me as well. But, you know, another guy that we've been talking about a lot, um, you know, that, that we took late in the process is Hardy. And Hardy's, you know, Hardy, just like we saw in high school film, scoring five you know, uh, uh, touchdowns in the state championship game, he's just a natural football player. You know, the, the game comes easy to him in some ways in terms of finding the ball in the air and things like that. So. Um, Obviously, other guys you guys have seen enough of, like Marquise and Ellis and those types of guys. But um, you know, there, there's some guys that are, that are probably jumping out in my mind right away. But I, I, I've missed someone. They're probably the guys. Hey, Coach Aikman. Good. Good. A little different question for you here. Uh, Penn State has a short history in the Cotton Bowl, but at least two of those games are pretty significant from you know 1970 and, and socially 1948. Any plans to talk to your team or have you talked to your team about you know kind of Penn State's history and significance? Yeah, so we plan um, on doing more of that, um, you know, as as the as the week progresses. But yes, um, we talked about doing some things uh, to maybe honor those teams as well and honor some of those players, like Wally Triplett, obviously. Um, so um, yeah, that's that's been something that's been discussed. We're very aware of it, um, you know, as an athletic department specifically specifically as a football program. The cop bowlers as well. So um, yeah, as the week goes on, we'll, we'll spend probably a little bit more time kind of talking about that, thinking about that. Hey, Coach Arnie. Good, Arnie. Yeah. Um, kind of took my uh, stole my thunder with that question. Um, <laughs> speaking of uh, Wallace Triplett and uh, Dennis Hogart, you know just the significance of their contributions to this program. I understand that you had uh, Mr. Triplett here a few years ago before he yeah. passed away, but um, to be able to go back down there. Play in this role with the type of history. What does that mean to you personally, and uh, you know, to some of the yeah, players on this team? Yeah, you know, I, I think the history I, I think is significant. And I think you could you know make the argument it's not just those two guys; it's how the whole team and how the whole community kind of rallied behind those guys. You know, I know there's a lot of different discussions and theories and, and, and thoughts on where that we are, you know, came from, um, but. That's the one I think that, that most of us identify with, you know. So, you know, for me um, and and for the team, you know, it's it's interesting because you know these guys. Sometimes we talk to them, you know, and we talk about things that we think they know and the history that we think they know, and they have no clue. You know, I mean, they think like the '90s were a long time ago, you know, which is which is scary to me on a whole other level. Um, but that's where I think it's important that we take some time kind of talking about these things and having some of the discussions, especially with some of the discussions that we had kind of throughout the year as well. You know, so you know, maybe connecting some of those storylines and talking about it. Again, a lot of the players, uh, when, when Wally came and spoke to the team, Mr. Triple came and spoke to the team, you know, a lot of those guys aren't here anymore. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going to spend some time kind of talking about the history, the significance. Um, I think we can make some great connections with some of the conversations that we had this year, you know, and then, and then obviously for me, you know, that, that's something that, that I don't spend a whole lot of time talking about, but I think the people that know me closely um, and people within our program, um, they understand how important that is to me, you know, 
know, uh, when, you know, in, in 2019, 2020, when you can say you're the first, you know, um, there's, there's, there's not a whole lot of opportunities to say that anymore. So hopefully, um, you know, we get to the point where those things are not conversations, you know, anymore. But um, I do think it's going to be important for us to take some time and kind of talk about that and the significance of that. I know the Cotton Bowl is aware too. James left Greer uh, at the end of the dinner banquet for the team. Nick Yuri was offered a scholarship. The reaction was kind of special from the family and from the program. It must be a perfect job to offer something like that at the end of the year. How did you reach the conclusion that his efforts match the scholarship? Yeah, so uh, he earned it. You know, we didn't offer him or give him anything. We, you know, he earned that. Um, a lot of times you kind of get in those situations and there's a lot of moving parts from an NCAA perspective and what you're allowed to do, uh, you know, from a, from a scholarships numbers perspective in terms of managing your roster. So there's sometimes you'd like to do some things, but it, it just doesn't work at that time. Um, but Yuri's been kind of on that path really since he got here, you know, in terms of just how he's gone about his business, the type of teammate he's been. Um, but then there also needs to be the right time, you know, so, you know, for us, uh, once we asked enough questions to compliance and, you know, and, and kind of went through some things as a staff, uh, you know, it, it made sense and this, this was the time to do it. So, you know, what was cool was, you know, when we were sitting there and the bank was getting started, I, you know, I knew we were going to do this and a few people on our staff knew we were going to do this, but then, you know, Yuri shows up and, his mom is with him. His dad's is with dad's with him. His grandma is with him. So I'm like, you know, this is this is perfect. So um, you know, just just a kid that's done everything the right way. And we got a bunch of guys in our program that I could make that argument. And it doesn't always end the storybook ending. It doesn't always play out that way. But when it can, you'd like it to. I do think it it, it reinforces for our team, um, you know, and, and for our community that. If you work hard and you put others first, um, that that you will be rewarded for that. Maybe not always in the time that you think you should be rewarded for it, but it, it's noticed. Sometimes the reward is not maybe maybe um, a scholarship in your hand, but it's the respect that you earn from the teammates and how you're remembered. Um, it, you know, kind of an interesting story that that goes along with that is I'm sitting with with Bowers, which is probably. Probably more impactful than the scholarship. To be honest with you, I'm sitting with Bowers and his family. We do like a little bit of a, like a little uh, reception for the seniors beforehand with the parents and, and and those guys and coaches taking pictures and all that kind of stuff before they come in. And Bowers' his sister is there, and we got a bunch of players now where their younger sisters now or younger brothers have come to Penn State too. So sitting there talking about it, talking about the family, and the mom brings up. You know, well, you know about whether she has a boyfriend or not, and um, as as a dad having two daughters, it's not a conversation that I enjoy having a whole lot. And um, and mom said, hey, Nick, is there anybody on the team that that you'd be comfortable with you know, dating with your sister? And he's like, No, except for maybe Yuri. <laughs> you know? and, and I think that that kind of speaks to the, the type of respect that that guy has earned. The scholarship says one thing, and that that says another. You know, so uh, he's just a neat kid. You know, he's just he's a neat kid. Um, and I remember all the way back, you know, after after you know signing Connor McGovern and the connection with that family, the school, and the community. You know, so you know, just as important as it is going out and signing that you know high profile recruit that everybody's excited about, and thinks that they're going to change the program. Um, these guys are just as important. The guys that are going to be in the locker room, the guys that are culture drivers, the guys that maybe aren't stuck showing up in the stat sheet or in the newspaper, um, but are critical for you to have the type of program that we want to have. And you know, Yuri's, Yuri's, Yuri's done it the right way from the time he stepped on campus. So I, I could not be more proud uh, of him and what he represents. James, I just wanted to go back to offensive coordinator for a moment. Shocker. I was wondering if you could shed any light on the timeline, and by that I mean, you know, is this an announcement that could come before the bowl game, or is this something you anticipate might not come until after the, the coaches' convention? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Okay. You know, um, 
I know you got to ask, but I, I've told you guys, you know, what I what I can tell you. Um, you know, when I have the decision made, uh, you guys will know. Uh, giving any more detail about it um, not only isn't appropriate, uh, but also also can impact the search. Um, you know, I'm not going and hiring some guy. You know, that's that's sitting down at champs. You know, uh, making all the calls after the play was run. You know, most of the guys that we're talking to. Um, you, 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 uh, there's a few of us in the room. Johnny, Johnny hindsight. Right here. Um, I was going to say that picks good up. But, but <laughs> most of the people we're talking to, you know, obviously are are sitting, you know, coordinators. That is in the NFL, or whether that is in college, and you got a few that aren't uh, that are part of the conversation as well. But um, the reason that we don't talk a whole lot about it is because it's not in Penn State's best interest. Um, you know, when when information starts to leak out, when when people are trying to track planes and planes, trains, and automobiles of where we're going, all those types of things, uh, I get the interest and I get the curiosity, but it really doesn't help. It hurts because if names you know, get out uh, before they should, it's going to make it more challenging for us to hire the right person for uh, for Penn State. Hey James, hey, you maybe you can bring Keegan back in for a body double to get on a different plane. Be good. Yeah. Um, late in the season, you had several teams coming off buys that you faced uh, that had a different way of attacking your pass rush. Given that you're going into a game with a long layoff um, and your team is uh, facing a team that has quality uh, offense and passing game like you mentioned. Do you expect to see something similar in those situations where it's a longer layoff, there might be some, some, something you hadn't seen yet on film, and how do you think you handle those curveballs throughout the season? Yeah, there, there's going to be a plan. There's no doubt about it. There, there always is. Um, you know, I think that the, the most important thing that we can have is, is – a bunch of fresh defensive linemen on the field, and that's where how we handle these bowl, bowl practices are important, that they get enough work that we're sharp, but also you know that we're, that we're rested and fresh and, and fast, and that's where the sports science all, all plays into it as well. You know, I think you know, there, there's a plan uh, always for defensive ends. It's hard to have a plan you know, with, with the inside guys. Um, so, you know, for us, the development of really all four guys on the field, you can't take them all away. So if they are going to have a plan for Etor, or they are, they are going to have a plan for Shaka, um, whatever that plan is of who they're double teaming, whether they're sliding, whether they're chipping, whether they're using the tight end, whether they're using the back, whether they're moving the pocket or whatever it may be, um, that plan that puts an emphasis on taking someone away creates opportunities for others. And that's where that needs to happen. When if the plan is specifically to impact Etours, um, you know, uh, impact the game, then that needs to create opportunities for others. So um, you know, that that's kind of how we look at it. No different than a great running back is great for the passing game. Having Saquon Barkley in the backfield, having Miles in the backfield, having the running backs that we have in the backfield right now create really good opportunities for our passing game, and vice versa. So they're kind of all complementary pieces. And the reality is, although we would love to take everything that they do away offensively, when you try to take one thing away, you're creating opportunities in other places. And that's with our offense, that's with our defense, that's with our offense, that's with our defense and special teams as well. And that's the chess match. You know, that, that's the chess match. I think for the most part, to your question, I think for the most part, um, I think we did a pretty good job of that all year long. Obviously, there's times uh, where you look back and you say, you know, we could be better in this area, and we need to be better in this area. There's no doubt about it. But uh, again, um, you know, uh, the, the narrative and, and, and the story, um, and, and looking back from a positive from a perspective on hindsight, uh, there's definitely things that, that we got to get better at. But there's also the other end of the spectrum where you look. We've had a fantastic season. Uh, there's probably 95% of the universities and colleges and football programs in the country that would love to be playing in the New Year's Six Bowl game right now uh, and be in a position to get their 11th win. So overall, good, uh, but but we understand, you know, there's there's very high standards and expectations. Roger. Okay. 
Thank you, James. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking about earlier about the freshman and the freshman role and that kind of thing, for a lot of these guys, it's a year where they're gone through stuff they haven't gone through before. And with Noah Cain, how do you think he's responded really since that Michigan State game? And how important has this layoff been uh, since the Rutgers game to kind of get him back to, to where he wants to be? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of times these guys are facing adversity for the first time. Uh, athletic adversity, I guess, is, is what I should say. A lot of these guys obviously all have different stories personally, but I'm talking about athletic adversity. So for him, you know, he's such a competitor. Football's very important to him. You know, we want to make sure, I think that's one of the things that's probably um, not discussed enough, is you better recruit guys that love football. You can't like football at this level. You, you gotta love it to do what you have to do to be successful at the highest level. And there are some guys that I think love the recruiting process and like football. And being able to identify who those guys are is, is really important. Noah is a guy that loves football. So part of the issue with him is you, know, you guys ask me each week and you know um, I really wasn't trying to be um, elusive you know, with my answers. He wanted to play every single week, even the first week. Um, and if we didn't have the depth that we had, we, we probably would have. Um, but he just wasn't right. And each week, we're kind of the next week, well, he'll be ready the next week. And it, it just kind of lingered for him. So the combination of that and, and the depth that we had at the position, uh, it, just, it just didn't make sense. But uh, he, looked, he looked really good yesterday. He looked normal. Where like before, you'd, you'd catch him limping at times and things like that. So um, uh, I, I think he's he's good to go now. You know? if, he, if he's not if he's not started, you guys will rip my butt about that after the game. But um, you know, the great thing is you see Journey stepped up, and Ricky and, and Devin. And, you know, we're in, we're in a good we're in a good situation there. But um, I think it was just one of those things. He needed time off of it. And as aggressively as he approached, you know, getting back, it just wasn't it wasn't enough for him to be 100. percent I also think the way he approached it is going to allow him to be 100 percent the whole game now, which I don't know if it would have been if he had, didn't attack it the way he did. Time for two more. We'll start with Mike. Hey James. Hey Mike. Uh, I don't think folks have had a chance to uh, ask this question. There's a report, maybe two, that you met with Florida State officials or representatives. Is that true? I did not meet with Florida State. Did not meet with Florida State's officials. There's a lot of reports out there. <laughs> I did not meet with Florida State's officials. Hey James, uh, I'll keep it quick. Uh, Got to get back to champs. You had a, a flood of guys come out immediately after last year's bowl game and make their announcements. Many of which were, were departures, and yet some that were ahead of that this year in terms of announcing that they were staying. I wonder if you could address that. Is there a positive carryover of getting some of those announcements out of the way before the bowl game and rolling into beyond? Yeah, I think we'll have, I think we'll have both. We'll have both. So what we do is right when the regular season ends, I set up meetings with all of those guys and their parents. And we've put an extensive amount of work in um, of projections of where we think they are based on conversations with GMs and scouts and all those types of things. Um, so we, we put all that together for them. Um, some, guys, some guys are ready to make the decision and that meeting kind of either pushes in the one direction or the other. We also have the ability with the NFL to be able to turn five names in to get evaluations from the NFL, um, actual evaluations from the NFL. We only get to do five, which can also be problematic because um, there's, there's probably more guys that want it than, than just five. Um, you know, and there's, there's all different factors into it. You know, um, typically, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. It's, it's first round. You really, you really should you know, plan on, on, on making that decision and moving on. You got the second round, which is pretty much a you know personal decision, but probably leaning more towards leaving. And then you got the third round or lower that all the data says that you should go back to school. 
but then obviously there's there's a lot of family dynamics and things like that that go into it. Um, you, know, you know, Pat Pat was was interesting. It was very similar to Mike Kosicki's meeting where I met Pat and went through it all with his family and his parents were like, you know, we're, we love it. We're, we're we're enjoying it. We're not ready for him to leave. We love the RV lots. We're having a great time here. All this stuff that we just went through, if this happens for him, awesome. If it doesn't, he's getting a great education. Pat was like, you know, uh, I appreciate it, but you know, I'm not ready to leave. I, I can't imagine myself going and living in a city by myself right now. You know, he's just, he's, he's, he's kind of enjoying this and feels like he needs another year of development. So the conversations are very different based on a, a thousand different uh, dynamics. Um, for us, uh, we do not recruit them. You know, I know some programs do that. I, I, I don't recruit them. My belief is we give them all the information that them and their family can make educated decisions. We kind of talk about it from both perspectives. Uh, the thing I think that's interesting that a lot of times I think the players, they're uncomfortable having a conversation with you because they think you're just going to tell them to come back. And the reality is, you want it to be a win-win. So if they leave early, it's in their best interest and our best interest that they get drafted as high as possible. Because that allows us to show our current players and the next recruits that, look, if you come here, you can get drafted high. Um, and if they come back to school, it's in our best interest to make sure that whatever they were projected at the year before, that the following year, they're higher. So, you know, for, for me, I just want to make sure that them and their family make an educated decision, that they have all the information. Um, and then once they do, we're going to love them and support the heck out of them to help them reach, reach their dreams. So, you know, uh, we'll, we'll have some more guys announce after the game because that's, that's when they want to do it. Um, and we've had a bunch of guys that, that have already announced that they're coming back, which is, which is great. You know, the, the challenge, you know, you guys have heard me say before that I think is there's going to be some rule changes in my mind from an NCAA perspective because it's always been a challenge to make projections and guesstimates on where you're going to be from a scholarship number, who's leaving early, who do you have to sign, all these types of things to get as close to 85. With the transfer portal, it makes it even harder to project that, especially with the hard cap rules that you have. So um, I do think there's going to be some, some rule changes from that perspective to create a little bit more flexibility. So um, you know, we'll, we'll be finding out uh, some probably around the same time you guys will. Uh, but there, there's, a, there's a good number that we already know what they're going to do and just waiting because they want to be respectful to announce after the game so the focus is on the game and not them. Thank you, Coach.